was about a year ago, nice, beautiful day like today, I decided to go out and hit some softballs with some friends. And while we were out there, I got a phone call from one of those unrecognizable numbers, you know, kind of the spam fraud calls. And so it did like everybody else, and I ignored it, right? And afterwards, I played the message, and I kind of had a chuckle. Because supposedly the Wisconsin Department of Justice was calling and left me a voicemail saying they would really like to speak to me about something and to call back on this number. And I kind of like looked at the message, listened to it, kind of chuckled with my friends. I'm like, yeah, how much? much you want to bet this is like some sort of fraud call, right? So, so I ignored it. In fact, I actually saw one of our officers later that night and it said, yeah, I got a uh, phone call from the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Kind of sounds suspicious, don't you think? And he said, yeah. I said, should we, should we call him back right now and kind of like play along with them a little bit? And, and we, we just kind of laughed it off. And then uh, probably like a month or two later, I get a phone call. This time it's from the Elko to Market PD. All right, that's not unexpected. I'm the police chaplain after all. So I get a, a phone call and I talk and it's Officer Craig Bell and he says, uh, hey Gordon, um, are you free right now? I was like, well, sure, why? You know, like, what's going on? And I'm thinking like maybe it's an emergency call and he's like, well, the Wisconsin Department of Justice is here at the station and they'd like to see you. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> uh, so, so you mean like that phone call I got earlier wasn't really a scam call? No, it's not. We really need you to come in tonight. Should I be concerned? <laughs> I'm thinking like, I haven't been in Wisconsin for, I don't know the last time I was in Wisconsin. Like what on earth would the Wisconsin Department of Justice want to speak to me, right? And it's one of those moments where you're thinking like, do I need a lawyer? Like do I, it's probably somebody I know got in trouble in Wisconsin and so they wanted me to come in as like some sort of character witness. Well, it was much more serious than that, but it turns out that I wasn't really the person they were looking for, thankfully, and uh, it was a pretty short conversation. <laughs> I'm just going to leave you hanging right there. <laughs> Maybe I could tell you offline uh, the rest of it. <laughs> Have you ever been accused of something you didn't do? Of course, right? And we've been in that situation. You remember what it felt like and you're kind of getting defensive and you're like, no, it wasn't me, right? We get all worked up. Maybe you remember how your anxiety creeps up when you get that phone call from the Wisconsin Department of Justice and you find out it wasn't a fraud call. <laughs> you remember that feeling? Maybe it was a time that you got pulled over. And just those lights behind you, that officer walking up to your car can kind of get your heart rate going. Even if it's for something as silly as a tail light that's out or them just wanting to say hi to the police chaplain because he was going through town, <clears throat> maybe just a tiny bit fast. Uh, you know how uneasy you can feel. Even I get that way as the police chaplain driving through my own town. I, I see Chief Brady there in the median. I'm like, oh boy, there's Chief. How, okay, I better go 50. <laughs> then they're going to pull me over because I'm going too slow, right? For many of us, just the sight of certain people or the thought of being in a certain situation is enough to get our anxiety going, to get our heart rate up and to get us feeling a little bit nervous. Now imagine that the stakes are much higher than, say, a simple speeding ticket or a uh, tail light being out. What if, what if it's something like truly life-changing? Something that bears with us some extreme circumstance or consequences. Maybe you, maybe be, you are accused of a crime which brings serious time in jail. Maybe it's a matter not necessarily of criminal law, but of civil law. And the outcome of the court is going to be life-changing. And you realize that your dreams are just about to be shattered if things don't go right. Now, can you imagine stepping into the arena of that courtroom on your own? I mean, how many feel confident to take on the law by themselves? To, to, all right. Chad is going to, okay. <laughs> Chad, just plug your ears when I make fun of you later. No. <laughs> right, I mean, could you imagine going in that court all alone, how, how nervous you would feel without representation? I mean, I get nervous even when I'm just called in as a witness to speak on somebody's behalf. Like, oh man, what's the other attorney going to ask me? Like, uh, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to speak for this person or not? And I can't imagine what it would feel like if I was the one who was about to go on trial. 
there's no way I would try to represent myself because no matter how smart I think I am at home, there's no way I'm that smart in court. I would go out and I would try to find the best possible lawyer I could find or afford or the one the state appointed to represent me because I don't have a clue and I need a guide, don't I? A good attorney knows the system, right? They know the arena in which they operate. They know what to expect and what is expected of you when you're in that courtroom. And they know how to be your guide. In our text today, the disciples may have been feeling a little bit terrified, feeling a little anxious because Jesus is telling them once again that he's about to leave. Not because they've been accused of murder, but because their lives once again are about to change forever. Jesus, their teacher, their rabbi, their beloved friend, their guide is about to leave them. And I'm sure there's this feeling among the disciples that would love Jesus to stay just, just a little bit longer. Can you like just stay with us past Easter? That would be great, right? Because we're kind of afraid. We're not sure what's going to happen, right? We're not ready, they probably proclaimed. You can't possibly leave us now. We're still trying to figure out that whole thing with the bread and how you fed all those people. And besides that, you haven't taught us the secret to walking on water unless we go up to Minnesota where the lakes freeze, right? We aren't ready to do this on our own. Besides that, I'm pretty sure that Thomas, Thomas lost that, that mustard seed you gave us, you know, when you were saying that if we had faith like this mustard seed, we could move mountains. Like mountains, Jesus, we can't even take care of that speck of sawdust in our eyes. And so how are we going to do this on our own? You can't leave us now. We are not ready for it. But Jesus assures them, and he says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. See, Jesus never promised his followers that it was going to be easy, but he assures them that they are not going to be alone, that he will not leave them as orphans, for he's about to send to them the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And the term used here is a legal term. If you've been hanging around the church for a while, this is one of those Greek words that pastors like to share because they like to think they know something. I just... So the word in the Greek is parakletos which is sometimes translated as counselor, helper, and advocate. Now, the paraclete, the, the parakletos, this term brings with it the image of a counselor, but not in the sense of the counselor that I go and see and I sit down on the couch and I tell them all life's problems and they say, what do you think? Right now, and it's not that kind of counselor. This is more of a counselor as in a lawyer as a legal counselor, someone who will come alongside of you and will help you navigate the trials ahead. Jesus assures his followers that just as he has been there as God's representative for them in the past, teaching them, guiding them every step along the way, so too will the Holy Spirit be there to function as their guide, to help them navigate the trials that lie ahead in their life. But he says not everyone will accept the gift that he's about to send. Now that seems kind of foolish, doesn't it? Like if you are given a gift, if, if you are given this opportunity to have representation, wouldn't you want it? Why would anyone not want the gift that Jesus has to offer? Why would anyone besides Chad want to enter into the courtroom and try to represent themselves facing some serious consequences, right? Especially if the outcome the court decides will be life-changing. Well, I guess you could say maybe they just don't know any better. Maybe they think they know the courtroom better than anyone else. Maybe you know that type of person in your life. Rather than accepting the consequences, rather than accepting the help, they want to argue with the judge. They want to tell the judge why the judge is wrong, right? They, they want to argue with their lawyer. They want to represent themselves, and they, they don't maybe may quite understand the seriousness of the consequences they face. Right? They don't understand the consequences of their actions or the significances of the charges. Jesus says the world will reject the Holy Spirit because the world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. 
Now here's a moment where I'm going to steal something from Pastor Melissa's message because sometimes I hear her getting ready for her Zoom service for Castle Rock. But I loved a point that she, she shared. And she said, it's like people want the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, but they don't want Jesus. Right? You're looking at me funny. You said something like that, right? All right, okay. I didn't want to misquote you, especially since I built it up. So great. So I was listening to her. I'm like, oh man, that's really good. I can't believe I didn't say that in my message, but now I did. So, thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Sometimes our spouses really do make us better. Uh, <laughs> and so it's kind of this idea like, ah, you know what? We might be interested in the Holy Spirit. We might like the idea of the power of the Holy Spirit, but we don't want to have anything to do with the Jesus thing. And there's this conflict that's been growing between the Jewish leaders and, and Jesus where they're like, ah, we're not quite sure about this person. And so the world is rejecting Jesus and therefore it cannot receive. It's kind of like that phrase, you don't know what you don't know until you know what you don't know, right? I've got to put that up on screen. You don't know what you don't know. Right? That is until you know what you don't know. Jesus says the world cannot accept the one he will send because they do not know what they do not know. They do not know the Son. They do not know Jesus. And therefore, if they do not know Jesus, how could they possibly understand? How could they possibly know the Spirit, the one that Jesus would send? They aren't looking for what is to come because they can't even see what is right there in front of them. They are completely aware, unaware of what they are missing. And so they never look for it. You see, we will never find what we are looking for if we actually don't take the time to look for it. We're chuckling, chuckling a little before the service, talking about things that we've lost and how it's driven us nuts and how we've gone off looking for that. Well, guess what? We're not going to find that object when we stop looking. I think one of our greatest struggles in America here is that we have actually like killed the spirit. Now, I, I know that's an over, overly dramatic thing to say, maybe a little bit too much, but I think you understand my point, right? In American faith, we have often silenced the Holy Spirit in our lives in exchange for what we know and what we can control and what it is that we are most comfortable with, right? And so we kind of tune out the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's like we hit the ball out of the ballpark, and then we stop at first base, just happy for the fact that we didn't get out this time, right? Just happy that we made it on base and we, we fail to realize that there is so much more ahead, right? We've got to go all the way around the bases, at least in baseball, you have to go touch every base before you can score that point. And we sometimes forget that. We settle in our faith, don't we? We are comfortable with what we have known and what is right there in front of us, that we stop looking for what God wants to do next in our life. We may believe in God. We might understand that Jesus loves us. But that's about us all far, as far as we go. We, we don't expect anything else from our faith. And, and once our golden ticket to heaven is punched, we think that's all there is. But Jesus offers so much more for you than a golden ticket to eternal life. Jesus came so that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly meaning that you can start living that kingdom life now, that you can experience more of Christ's presence even now. But for many, the spiritual journey often stops with the most elementary part of our faith. We believe, therefore we are finished. We put our, our, our hour in each week at church, we set aside, and then we go around and set aside our faith for the rest of the week. We stop tuning in to hear the voice of God. We stop digging deeper and reading and studying scripture for ourselves, learning to recognize God's voice. We have stopped paying attention to the ways that the Spirit might be at work and moving among us. You see, we will never hear the Spirit speak if we're drowning out the Holy Spirit with all of our own noise. How do we do that? How do we drown out the Holy Spirit? Well, we do that by ignoring our conscience, by doing what we know we ought not to, and by not doing the things that we know we should. We do it by pursuing our own desires and our interests first and putting that ahead of everything else. We do it by justifying our thoughts and our actions instead of taking time to listen to God's convictions. 
We drown out the Holy Spirit's life with our daily choices, with the daily choices we make. And the Holy Spirit doesn't really go away. It's still there. It's always there for us. But every choice we make that goes against what God desires for our life is kind of like we turn the volume up just a little bit louder and a little bit louder and a little bit louder. You know something? When I turn the volume up in the car, it doesn't mean the kids have stopped fighting in the back seat, right? They're still there. They're still making noise. It's just I can't hear it anymore. So it's like we try to drown out the Holy Spirit with each choice we make. Some ways, maybe the cartoon depictions are somewhat accurate. You know the ones where they have an angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other, and, and you kind of are listening and trying to figure out which one you're going to listen to. Well, it's not necessarily that we have turned to the little Satan in our life sitting on our shoulder, but we have stopped paying attention to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We have stopped paying attention to the voice of God. You see, God desires so much more for you than an elementary faith that we often settle for. God wants to take your faith deeper, to draw you closer to him, to unlock a deeper, fuller, more rich experience with him. To give you the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you want that in your life? Do you want to experience more from your faith? When I was in college... Every year, the school would bring in a keynote speaker for a session of chapel uh, experiences in the evening that we called Deeper Life. Now, when you were like a senior and junior, you called it Deeper Strife because you had heard some of these messages a few times. But I remember that first year when I was at Crown and I was listening to the speaker, I was eager, I was hungry, I was growing in my faith, and I loved taking that extra time in the evening to sit in the presence of God and to soak up and to, to learn more about the ways that God could work and move in my life. But there was something that I still longed for. You see, I had been active in my faith my whole life. I attended church frequently throughout school, like just, I mean, we were the, just about a every week kind of family. As a little kid, I got involved in the ways that I could. As a youth, I, I joined the adult choir, and my best friend in the choir was the 80-year-old bass that I sat next to. And I mean, I had great memories of my church, and I was active in my church, and I had great people in my life. But when it came to talking about the Holy Spirit, I had read through the Bible in eighth grade. I read through it in my junior year of high school. I even had this call to ministry in my life. But when I heard other people talking about the Holy Spirit, that was something that was maybe not an area that we spent a whole lot of time talking about in my church. And when people were describing their experiences, I'm like, wow, I've, I've, I've never experienced that before. I've never been like thrown to the ground in like seizures or anything that seems kind of strange i've never spoken in a foreign language other than one that i'm trying to mimic and yell at towards my kids <laughs> now like I, i'd never experienced some of these things that they were talking about and so i'm like wow I, I just i don't know if i've been filled with the holy spirit and so i remember after that first year of college going back to the summer camp that i worked at and, and there was granny and I was excited to share with Granny all the things that God was doing in my life and all the ways that I had grown in my faith and I sharing all these things with Granny at breakfast one morning. And, and then I ended the conversation with a little bit of a disappointment. I said, but Granny, I still haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. And she smiled at me. You know the kind of smile that Grannies make when they know something that you don't know? <laughs> And she didn't tell me right then and there, but uh, later when I saw her at lunch, she had an article for me written by Dr. David, David Jeremiah. And it was on understanding what the filling of the Holy Spirit was. And she gave me this article, said, here, I want you to read this. And so I read that, uh, that article, and David Jeremiah explained, using this passage from Ephesians, do not get drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit, to explain how being filled with the Holy Spirit is about God's influence in our life. It doesn't necessarily mean some dramatic conversion where we fall on the ground shaking, where we all jump up and just start dancing and, and speaking in different tongues and languages and things like that. That can happen. It's not my experience, but I know it's been the experience of others. But instead, this, this article helped me understand that all along, God was filling my life with the presence of his Holy Spirit. 
And she helped me understand how, how God was working even when I didn't see it, even when I didn't understand it. That I was experiencing the fullness of what God had for me. You see, God wants to share his gift with you. God wants to share his heart with you. God wants to give you a heart for things that he has a heart for. God wants to fill your life with his presence and with his power and to lead you to a richer experience of faith. But we will never find ourselves experiencing the kind of faith that is active and powerful like this if we never give our hearts and our attention to God. Recently, Melissa and I watched the movie Harriet, uh, a pretty well done movie, to be honest, on Harriet Tubman's life. And I had to go back and kind of fact check a few things because there were these visions that she had. And I was wondering, like, well, how much of that was true and how much of that was like Hollywood trying to portray her faith? And I'm embarrassed to say this. But I actually forgot that Harriet Tubman was Methodist, that she had Methodist roots and backgrounds, and there's a whole other conversation about race as to why she was a Zion Methodist and not a United Me or Methodist with Methodist Episcopal and all that, the segregation that was going on at that time. But she had this devout, rich faith. And part of her journey is she had these prophetic word or visions from God that helped guide her to freedom. You see, it wasn't her wits that led her to freedom. It wasn't her confidence that led her to freedom, but it was her confident faith in a God who was there as her guide. And all along her journey, God helped her. You see, it's not our wits or our confidence that leads to freedom. It is a confident faith and obedience to God. Jesus says, if you love me, then you will obey what I command. And what did Jesus command? His command was this, that we love one another just as Jesus has loved us. Obedience comes from love, not from fear. And if we fail to follow even those most basic commands of Jesus in our life to love, then how will we ever expect to follow in the more complicated commands? If we fail to allow Jesus to be our guide in the way we love, how can we expect the Holy Spirit to be our guide in the way we live? The world cannot receive what it will not accept, what it is not looking for, but you can. You can experience what God intends for you. So come and see the counselor, but you got to look for it. You got to pay attention to the ways that God is at work, to realize that God is at work all around you, to listen for his voice, to dive into scripture, to learn to tune in. Maybe start someplace simple like reading through the book of Ephesians and listening, what is it that God says about who I am? What is it that God thinks of me? And you've got to obey. To obey God's command to love. To love others just as Christ has loved us. See, Jesus promises the disciples that they would not be alone. <clears throat> that he would send them another helper. A counselor. And although the world would not receive him, they will. Because they have seen and believed the one who came from the Father. They have received the Son. I know we all have been distancing. We all have been living lives of isolation. But we are not alone. For we have God who is with us. Jesus has promised not to abandon us, not to leave us as orphans. He has given us a guide, a teacher a representative to carry out the work of his kingdom every day. So pay attention. Look, listen, and obey. When your heart beats a little faster, when you see somebody in need, that's the Holy Spirit saying to give, to help out, that you have something that you can do to help take care of that situation. When someone comes to your mind during the week, and you think, oh man, I, I haven't seen them for a while. I should really send them a note, let them know I'm thinking of them, encourage them. That's the Holy Spirit reminding you to bless and to share a gift of encouragement, to give them a call or send them a text and let them know that you are thinking of them and praying for them. When you face temptation and you know that you're in a situation you don't want to be, and you can feel that anxiety building. Maybe you're even feeling that tension to the point where like, you might even begin to shake. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you, saying, choose a different path. When you realize that you have done something wrong, when you've messed up, 
Repent and confess and do what you can to make things right for you know that the Holy Spirit is talking to you. And when, there, when you are reading Scripture, and there's something that pops out, something that catches your attention. Maybe there's something that you have a question about. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you, and He will. Come and see the Counselor, for you have an advocate, a helper, and a guide. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today, and we thank you that you are indeed with us through the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. You have promised not to abandon us. And so, God, I pray that if there is anyone here today that longs to know your presence, that they would take this moment simply to invite you to come in, to come into their lives, to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord Jesus, I put my hope, I put my faith, I put my trust in you. I know you have loved me and you have given yourself for me. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today, I mean really all of us who, who desire so much more, we pray, Lord, that, that you would come and that you would fill our lives. As we pray this simple prayer, Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your presence so I may t pay attention, so I may look, so that I may listen and hear the voice of that is guiding me. Lord, help me to experience all that you have for me. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.